I'm excited to be here. Um, I do have sort of a loud voice, so hopefully you can hear me in the back. I, uh, I'm going to, let's see. Do, 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 do. Power this, cancel. I'm going to unmute the projector. OK. Um, so I actually really like interactive conversations. So I actually don't mind if you know people want to make comments or, or anything during the presentation. Um, and for those of you who are interested, I have a, the bit.ly link for a personality test because I'm going to talk a little bit about you know a little bit about the psychology of being an entrepreneur, how to think about um, being an entrepreneur. And I think I'm a big believer that the more you understand about yourself, what drives you, what motivates you, and what you're passionate about, it will help you be a better entrepreneur. So the bit.ly link is kj5hpi, and I realize people in the back might not be able to see that, but so. I, um, I did not start out as an entrepreneur. How many of you are on your second career? How many are on your third? Okay, fourth? <laughs> if I kind of count my jumps, right, I'm like on my third and a half career, if I think about the, how I transitioned and kind of went through my career. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but what I want to talk about is, you know, tapping into the things that you're passionate about. So you're going to start and you're going to go do something. And then as you go on, you're going to figure out what you love to do. And when I say what you love to do, it doesn't mean necessarily, um, you know, I'll give you one example. I was a patent attorney for 10 years. And if anybody said, Sarah, do you love to sit down and just write patents day after day after day after day after day after day after day? I'd say, no, no, I, actually, I don't. I don't love it right? Which is sad because you hear all the time that you should love what you do. So when I sat back and I really started to think about, do I really love what I do? You start to think about other things, right? Yes, I was a great patent attorney. I was really good at it. I could sit down and write a patent like nobody's business, right? But I didn't love it. What did I love? Well, I loved the technology. I loved meeting with my clients. I loved the new innovative ideas that they came up with. I love that I was seeing cutting edge technology before anyone else was seeing it. All of that great stuff. And I really decided that I actually wanted to go and create. Like the, the people across the table from me, my clients sitting across the desk from me, were having way more fun than I was. And I wanted to go do what they were doing. So that's what I mean when I, when I talk about finding what you love to do. You can be really good at stuff, and you're going to find as you go through your career, you're going to be good at a lot of things. But how do you tap into what you love to do and leverage, um, leverage those uh, uh, talents that you have? Okay, so let's try to get this to go for it. Okay, so this Wordle is just something that I put together over the weekend. So last Friday, we got together about 600 high school students in the Greater Salt Lake area to help them get excited about technology, to expose them to technology and what they, um, and, and get them passionate about technology because we just simply don't have enough of our kids going into technology. Computer science happens to be one of those areas where the percentage um, attendance in university levels is actually decreasing over time, but the jobs are increasing and in 2020 we're going to have a million unfilled jobs. So one of the things I'm really passionate about is getting more of our kids into technology and more of the adults into technology. But I'm really really careful that when I talk to girls about technology, so this was actually from a group of girls, my message to them is you shouldn't become a programmer and sit behind a, a computer all day long and just code and code and code and code and code, right? There's not, there's actually not there's people that love to do that, but I'm just, I'm pragmatic. Not everybody's going to love to be a coder, but what's the value? Well, when we sat down and said, and we started with the question of what are you passionate about? You know, and it doesn't even have to be related to technology. This is what they came up with. So you found that a lot of girls were passionate about design and gaming and writing and drawing and music and family and all these great things. And my message to them is don't leave what you're passionate about. Marry that passion with technology and find a way to leverage that to create something that impacts society. There's really fun women in technology that do all sorts of things with what they're passionate about. And then they have, you know, they're able to, to plug into technology or utilize technology or create apps or create, you know, products that are able to change the world, but they don't veer away from their passions. So that's... Um, something that I'm really uh, 
passionate about is making sure that that message comes across to do what you love. Um, so these are the places where I have been. So I started at Workman Heidegger as a patent attorney and became a partner there. Um, like I told you, my clients were having way more fun than I was. So I made a shift, went to School Improvement Network. And that's an educational technology company. So that started out with educators, people who were in the school system, and they found a better way to teach teachers. They said, well, gosh, what if we took a camera like this, put it in the classroom, and started filming the best teachers all across the country? And then what if we started sharing those videos and gave those videos to teachers and said, hey, here's a master teacher. You just came out of your college of ed program. Let's show you what a master teacher looks like. How do they talk? How do they deal with students of all different you know, skill levels and modalities of learning? And then about five or six years ago, they figured out, well, what if we took these videos and instead of putting them in a DVD library, like you, you, half of you probably don't even remember that, um, but, but what if we started putting them online and creating a subscription service to school districts? Well, their company grew 100% every single year over the last five years because guess what was happening at the same time? The economy is downturning, right? So nobody wanted to pay for, for these videos that sat on the professional development counselor's office. They could do a subscription that was actually less um, per teacher. And these teachers could access these videos 24-7. And y y the traditional model of professional learning, for, and I don't know how many of you come from education. Do, do I, have you, any of you been teachers? Uh, sort of. Okay. So what, what they do is they hire an expert. They say, hey, expert, you've written a book. And I really like your book. So we're going to fly you into, into um, our school, and we're going to pay you $6,000 a day to train our teachers. That's pretty good money for that expert, right? But that's one day of learning for those teachers. So you, so you know in the school systems they have all of those PD days that your kids are off and you have to, you're like, why are they taking another day off of school, right? That's what that's for. So they used to use those days to have experts come in and teach and do professional learning for these teachers. And for that same cost of that one day of learning, you could provide an entire video library of a thousand videos to educators for the same price that they could access 24-7. So it was a really great scalable model. And so School Improvement Network is, is one of the fastest growing companies in Utah, started in Utah. Most of its employees are here in Utah. It's, it's located in Midvale. It's actually be going to be growing uh, and uh, taking over the Larry H. Auto Center in Salt Lake City because they're growing that quickly. Um, so education is another, you know, that's a great example where there was people passionate about changing what was happening in that industry and taking technology and combining it and making a difference. Um, Canvas was mentioned earlier, and I spent a lot of time doing business development with this company, so I'm familiar with a lot of the education companies. Canvas went through a similar process. They went and interviewed a lot of the universities, and they said, you've got these you know, course platforms. What do you love? What do you hate? What could we do better? How can we better service your students? And then they took all of that feedback and created a new platform. So in any industry, you're going to find that technology has a great ability to change the way that that industry operates and it's going to take people who are passionate about that area of technology to make that difference. So while I was at Workman Eidegger, I started an organization called Women Tech Council. I would say that's probably my first entrepreneurial experience. Um, you know, I was just a boring attorney back then. And so, but I was really passionate about more women getting, uh, being supported in technology. Um, you're probably not surprised that there's very few patent attorneys that are women. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that you have to have a science background and then a law degree and then take a couple of bars. And so, you know, there's this big process to become a patent attorney. So you find very few women in, in you know, being patent attorneys. Very similar, I think, a little bit to technology. So a bunch of us from the Utah technology business um, community got together and we said, let's create an organization and let's make sure it's sustainable. Now, when you think it's about sustainability for an organization, for any company that you're going to create, you want to make sure you're solving a problem. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but are you solving a problem? And how do you know what that problem is? And how do you know that the, that the customer is going to be happy, right? So what we did is we actually followed a little bit of a lean startup process. How many of you are familiar with lean startup? Okay. You'll probably get more familiar as you go on in the entrepreneurial program, but Lean startup is this idea that you need to understand what the customer needs, that you're really focused on solving the problem. You don't come out the chute saying, 
I know how to fix it until you really understand what the problem is. So we actually got a bunch of um, leaders in the technology community together and we said, okay, if we were gonna support women in technology, where does the focus need to be? And if you, if you, you know, if you studied anything about gender issues in the workplace, it, it's all over the map, right? From women's rights to, to you know, flexible arrangements and all of that thing. The feedback that we got was, gosh, if you can fill an organization that really focuses on the economic value of women at executive leadership and raising the visibility of women in technology, that's of value to us. And so we started this organization seven years ago and we found that our customers have been very, very happy if you view it from, from that perspective, how we kept the customers happy. We've had sponsorship model that's kept the organization going. We have 2,000 members and we have 5,000 members through social channels. And we have sponsorships every single year and our sponsors keep coming back every single year. So I would argue that we've kept our customers happy. So starting to think like an entrepreneur, even if you're doing a nonprofit, some of the same um, principles apply. Okay, so I left School Improvement Network. Oh, wrong button. And I started my organization called Codify to try to get more adults into technology learning. Now, I dissolved, I dissolved Codify at the end of the year, and there's a lot of lessons learned. A lot of you, when you go and do your first startup, you may not succeed, and there's a lot of reasons why. I mean, there's so many things that go into running a startup. And so then I also joined a uh, patent law firm to do business development, and I do that part-time. So as you're thinking about doing your own startups, sometimes the answer isn't always to just quit your job and just to do it. I do business development for Patent Law Works part-time because it really actually gets me into the places where I want to be as far as where I want to, um, where I kind of see my space being as an entrepreneur. And so it was a great fit, um, and it's, I love the people there, and I still want to keep my foot in patent law, so it was a great way for me to do that on a part-time basis and then run my new company, which is called Infinity, Affinity. And that is my consulting business that I have, and I run all of my entrepreneurial projects under that, under that brand name. So I'm still with these three organizations, and um, what I love about it's, it sounds like I'm doing a lot, but there's actually a lot of overlap if you, um, if you kind of understand what my passion is, right? So from the patent side, I'm still very passionate about technology. From the Women Tech Council, I'm very passionate about supporting women in technology, and a lot of tech companies are supportive of that as well, right? So it kind of blends um, the conversations that I have with these two. And then with Affinity, I do a lot around technology learning. Um, like I go into large companies and I go and help their business units get more, a better understanding of technology foundations and strategic thinking about how they're doing technology. And that also is a big, uh, a lot of my clients come from the technology space. So you can see that I've really kind of centered my activities around these places where actually um, I can get multiple things done with kind of the same core set of customer and clientele. Again, technology being you know, one of my main focuses, because I love it. Okay, and they also have a really cute family. So sorry, just a little braggy moment. Um, okay, so what do you think being an entrepreneur is like? So I don't know if any of you have seen this graphic before. It's, it's like all fun and games, right? Because how many of you have started your own businesses? Okay, good, so we have about a third of you have, and that's exactly what it's like, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so I like to, see, this is kind of the reality, right? It's like, that, I mean, it's, it's hard, and you've gotta motivate people to, to do things, and you've gotta figure out, like, how do I get this person to do something that I want them to do, and, you know, if you're bootstrapping, you gotta get people to work for you for free. That does look like more fun, though. That, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's some bike, some cycling involved, some mountain biking, some boating, and some golfing, right? Exactly. <laughs> it is, but, but it's, it, is, it is a lot of fun, actually. And I spend a lot of time billing hours. I spend a lot of time traveling all over the country, working in education. It was fun, but man, I love like doing my own thing. And so even though this looks harder, being an entrepreneur is actually really, really rewarding for me personally, and it may not be for everybody, and so you gotta make sure it's, it's, it's what you love to do. Um, 
but it is hard work. So I want to talk about some things that may help make it just a little bit easier, just lessons that I've learned. Because like I said, you know, I went through one startup and kind of had to close it out and, and, and now doing my own thing. Um, but let's start with building your skills, your strengths, and your emotional quotient. So this is where this um, personality test, it's called the Myers-Briggs personality test. How many of you have taken it? Okay. How many of you thought it was pretty darn accurate? Okay, so we've got about 80% of the original people that raised your hand. Um, I felt like mine was really, really accurate. And I took it like when I was 30 and I thought, I'm taking this way too late. Why am I just discovering now what my skills are, right? Because I had been trained through school and through my university that my value was being able to be a good patent attorney. And I learned that, that I, I needed to stop thinking that way, right? Because I was limiting, limiting what my value was. But I will tell you that when I first started out, it was hard for me to define what my skills were. Like if, if somebody sat you down and said, okay, I want you to forget what your industry is. What's your skills that will translate across industries? If I took you and transplanted you into a different industries, what skills would carry? <coughs> And when I transitioned from patent law into ed tech, everybody said, oh my gosh, you're making such a huge shift in your career. And I thought I was at the time, but now that I've been through that experience, I can tell you exactly what skills translated from being a patent attorney to going into ed tech. And that those skills, it didn't really matter which industry I was in. I can take those skills and I can move them into healthcare. And I can take those skills and I can move them into automotive sales, right? Like I know what my skills is and I can describe them. If you can understand what your skills are that translate across industries, you'll be that much more ahead. Because I actually believe that it makes you less afraid. It makes you less worried that you can't do something. I remember I was very scared to make the transition from being a patent attorney to ed tech. Once I finally did it, I thought, okay, I think I can, I'm okay with change. But I was really, really, really nervous. And I, so I think understanding who you are, what are your innate skills that aren't defined by what degree did I get, what job have I done, you know, that aren't defined by those measurements, I think it would be a very, very interesting exercise for you. And if you can't describe your skills, take a minute to sit down and really think about it. That's why I think the myers Big is really interesting. Um, I think that, um, I don't know if it's easy for you in the back to see this, the color code is interesting. Um, the color code is interesting because I think it goes to motivation. So if you can understand how people are motivated, I think it helps you interact with people. And if you're doing a startup, you're going to be trying to motivate a lot of people because you need to get people on board with your vision. Strength Finders 2.0 is another great one. Um, it's, it, it's pretty cheap on Kindle. They'll give you a little code and then you go and take the test and it gives you 20 seconds to answer each question. And I like that because you can't overthink it. You can't be like, yeah, I really want to be competitive, but I, you know. Your innate skill set is innate, and I think Strength Finders helps draw that out. And what I like about Strength Finders is, and it really rung true with me, is a strength, you know, we spend so much time trying to fix our weaknesses. We like, you know, we're like, I got to fix this. I got to be better. I got to be better. Well, when you stop and think about, well, what are your strengths? And I liked how it defines strengths. And it's not something we usually hear because I went through you know, law school and I went through chemical engineering and I'd hear people say, oh my gosh, you're so smart, you're so smart, you're so smart. Well, of course, who doesn't like hearing that, right? Yeah, I did something really hard. Who doesn't like hearing that? But the way strength finders define strengths, I loved it because they said a strength is sometimes you don't know it's a strength because it's like breathing air. Do you stop and think about breathing air? You know, do you stop and think about like the person who can just whip out calculations in their head and you're like, wow, how do they do that? That is a strength that they were blessed with and they ought to leverage that. They need to figure out a way to leverage it because it comes so easy to them. Um, this helped me understand why am I so good at connecting people? Like it's effortless. Like some people, you know, it's like, um, you know, accounting for me. Anything that has to do with accounting is like pulling my teeth. It just drives me nuts. Like getting my taxes done, it's like, oh, I'll just watch another episode of this. You know, <laughs> because it's like, 
it's, it's that thing that I procrastinate that's so, you know, and a lot of you are saying, oh, accounting is so easy, Sarah. What's the big deal, right? Okay, well, that is your strength and is not mine. But things like connecting people, right? Every week I'm connecting four or five people together and I don't get paid for it, but I just do it because why? I, I don't know. I just sit there and think, oh, you know, I think this person really needs to know that person. And I don't know why, but I just have this feeling that they need to get to know each other. So I'll just shoot off an, you know, an intro email or something like that, right? And it's something that I've kind of worked into my processes as I network. Whenever I meet somebody, I think, who are two people that I want to introduce that person to? But it's something that comes super easy to me, right? Because I have a connector type personality and some people don't, and that's fine. And you know, I've, I figured out how do I use that as a strength for me because it comes so easily to me. It has nothing to do with law. It has nothing to do with chemical engineering. It has nothing to do with anything that I went to school for. It's just something that I was born with. And those, we can learn that they can be our strengths and we can figure out how do we leverage them to make us a be better business person. And then emotional quotient is always another good thing. How many of you heard of emotional quotient? Uh, not very many people. Okay, so go look it up. So all of you know what IQ is. EQ has to do with more how do you interact with people and do you have like the emotional maturity when you're interacting and dealing with situations. Um, it's really, really um, enlightening. They also have a test and I remember taking it and getting like 65%. And you know, I came from that school background where I'm like, well, 65 is like an F, you know? And I'm failing this emotional quotient thing. So it's something that I kind of vowed to work on because um, you know, how people leave when you interact with them, the, the feeling that they get of, you know, is that somebody that I want to work with? Is that somebody that I want to be in my network? That's really, really important to me. And it also applies to your teams. Like when you're in business and working with teams, it also applies to how you interact with team members and whether or not they enjoy um, working with them. And it really goes to how you can motivate people. Um, and so, so it helped me to really reflect and be more self-aware on how I interact with people. So just some skills I think that will help you as you become entrepreneurs and kind of go down your pathway. So these are the Myers-Briggs temperaments, and you can see that some, they've kind of put names to these. These have nothing to do with careers that you should be at all. But back in the day, somebody decided, well, we're going to just call this personality type a counselor personality type. And it's funny, because I, I know one of these people, and she's totally a counselor. Like, I can sit there, and she's like, come lay on my couch and talk to me for an hour. And she's like my counselor. So these are actually kind of accurate. Um, can anybody guess what my personality type is? An S, right here, performer? Oh. Okay, so you think somewhere in here, rational? Okay, that's actually, those are really big compliments. I'm actually this horrible field marshal up in the corner. <laughs> and I was like, who invented that name? That's the worst. Like Hillary Clinton's a field marshal personality. Nice. But, <laughs> And you'll find, like, Napoleon Bonaparte, right, is, is a field marshal. But, but that's okay, right, because I learned that there's great skills with this personality. And that's, when you do your Myers-Briggs, you'll find that there are great skills with every single personality. And it takes the spectrum for personalities to make the world run, right? So you need, like, the field marshal person, the person that's kind of seeing and understanding the big strategy and understanding the small strategy at the same time. That happens to come very easily to me, and it's a you know it's great, and really understanding that that's a uh, skill is is a great thing. So as each of you you know understand your personality, you'll find those things that you'll be able to leverage and realize like that that is a really great skill that I have. So, but I actually like this version better, which is the Harry Potter version, <laughs> right? It's like a, it's a little bit more modern version, so it's. I, I like this one better, anyway. Okay, so just some thoughts about thinking like an entrepreneur. And some of these come from lean startups, some of these come from um, this concept called customer development. But as I started my, my first startup, Codify, and then as I reflect on Women Tech Council, some of these things really ring true. 
So um, customer development kind of, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process and a method by which you really try to understand what is the customer, are we solving the customer's problem? So you're really focusing on the customer, right? And I really like that they say, your job is to discover a business model. You don't have a business yet. So if you're incorporated, you, you divvied out the equity, you decided what shares, you decided if you're, how you're gonna dissolve, what's gonna happen, and you're like, we have a business. I love that reminder that you actually don't have a business. Your job as a startup is to figure out and define a business model. Once you've figured out the business model that drives revenue, then you have a business. So if you think about that, it kind of changes the way you think about how you operate. And I really like that because a startup team works better together when you realize that you all together are working to, to try to figure out a business model. Okay. Focus on the problem, not the solution. So of course you need a solution, but think about the problem. So was it at Einstein that said, if I had an hour to think about something, I'd think about the problem for 55 minutes and the solution for five minutes. And then customer development, I would encourage you to go look things up like this. So customer development and customer validation You'll hear a lot more about it if you spend time in the startup community. Um, I'm going to talk about an organization um, that's really fun if you want to get your toes wet in startups. But we really focus on customer de development a lot, which is understand what the customer wants and needs, and then build your product based on what the customer is telling you. And then, of course, iterate, iterate, iterate. So we'll go over this really quick, which is the Lean Startup Cycle. This is a very basic version of it. But basically, you know, you start it with an idea, you build it, you test it, and by testing, I mean get it in front of a customer. Have the customers give you feedback, have them validate it. Ask them, would, would you pay money for this? And if they won't, then you might not have a business, right? A, a business model. You might need to go back and pivot and iterate, switch to a different plan, you know, slightly different plan. It doesn't have to be a 180, but maybe pivot a little bit rebuild it, and go test it again. So this is kind of the lean startup process where through this process you're really understanding what the customer needs, are you solving a problem, are they willing to pay for it? Because at the end of the day, if you're not willing to pay for it, then you don't have a business, right? Okay, so I also think that this applies in our careers as well. I just spent a lot of time telling you about my career path, how I had to sit there and rethink, is the customer happy? I'm the customer, right? Am I happy? Am I doing what I love to do? Have I figured out what I love to do? Am I able to take those talents that I have and apply them in a way that where I thrive, where I feel like I'm thriving and making a difference? So if you're not, you can pivot. One of the ways to pivot if you're working full time is try to do a startup part time with someone. Or you know, if you really know what you want to do or you have an opportunity to join an entrepreneurial endeavor and, and you know that's what you want to do, then you know, do it if, if that's what you want to do. Um, but I think that that idea of iterating is what we're seeing in our career pathways right now. We, see, we, we just said earlier that some of us are on our third and fourth careers, and that's a very normal thing these days. In fact, me staying at the law firm for 10 years actually was a really long time, actually. Okay. So Startup Weekend, so we just had one in Provo. How many of you heard of this? Did some of you hear about this? Okay, we tried to get it to the universities, but um, I know Isaac was there. Was he the only one out of this group that was there? Salt Lake City. Were you, did you go to Salt Lake City? Okay. So I'm a big fan of Startup Weekend um, for, uh, for a few reasons, but one of the reasons is Utah has a great startup culture. Um, Ogden, Salt Lake and Orem are kind of, you know, uh, the hubs of startup. And what I like about Startup Weekend is you spend two and a half days together with a team. P these are people that you may or may not know. And you pitch an idea and you launch it in two days and you get as much customer validation in as you can in two days. And why that's hugely helpful is I was blown away by what products were able to be created in just two days. Like I've, I was on two, I was at the Salt Lake the uh, Salt Lake one in 2013. Is that the one at the Junior Achievement Center, right? 
Oh, the year before. Okay, so you didn't do the, the last one. Okay, so I did that one, and then I did Startup Ogden, and then I helped organize Startup Provo this time. Have any of you launched a product in two days? It's hard, right? It's hard, but it's doable. That's what's fascinating. It's, you actually had functional, like, my team, we built and we submitted an app to, the, to, to Apple in two days. I mean, that's pretty phenomenal. And so you get great technology talent that's there, and they take these ideas and we build them and then you launch them. Well, for me, why that's really important is because if you're doing a startup, you can often end up spinning your wheels overthinking things. It's fascinating. Like you can get in your committees and you can be thinking and thinking, thinking, and you're not spending enough time doing. So Startup Weekend is really great because you spend the whole week working. And the goal is to launch by the end of Saturday, pretty much. And it's fascinating. It's great products that come out of this. A few startups, a few successful startups have come out of this. So it's great. So if you get a chance to do a Startup Weekend, um, I would encourage you to do it just to get your feet wet and you know, kind of what is, what is a startup sort of like. Um, the other great thing is there's no risk. So right, you, you don't commit to go into business with these people. You can walk away at the end of the weekend and you don't have to feel like you can move forward with it. Some people end up moving forward with their startup ideas and some people don't and that's perfectly fine. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, so um, do you have to have a lot of uh, entrepreneurship knowledge or business knowledge to be part of these? Um, I would say no. I, th I think that um, what we are finding though is you do have a lot of people with a lot of experience coming to this. So you've got really excellent um, technolo technologists coming you have great designers. I mean, some of the, um, you know, the user interfaces that are designed over the weekend are amazing. And you, we ha you have a lot of successful entrepreneurs came. Like the winner of Startup Weekend Provo had actually built his own company um, here around Inside Sales. So he pitched an idea here at Startup Provo around an inside scale, uh, a, a kind of a scalable sales business model that's sort of like Elance, and he ended up winning. So he had already built his own company. So so you have a lot of successful people that do come to these. And that's also what's great is you can network with some really great people who love the startup community. OK, so find your passion project. For me, these are some of my passion projects. And um, like I said, there's a huge overlap between them. So um, it's a nice way for me to blend all of the things that I care about personally. Be a futurist. So, you know, one of the things that I think is really important is understand where is the future headed? What is going to change certain industries? Um, you know, be technically proficient. That doesn't mean everybody has to be a coder. I, I don't believe that everybody has to be a programmer. But I do think that the more you understand about technology, big data, um, how business information is used, accessed, and then how it um, is used to get companies ahead. All of that, you know, all of that stuff like SEO, it's really, really critical. Understand the global skills base. Understand that you don't have to get all your talent from Utah. You can get it from lots of other places, right? Um, and how do you utilize technology tools, which are so easy these days, and of course, big data is a really big wave coming up. And then build your dream team. So what I mean by that is that doesn't necessarily mean your startup team. What I mean is that's your team of people around you that are going to help you be successful. Sometimes you'll hear these people called sponsors. Um, and I, I don't love the word sponsor, but the idea, when I say sponsor, do you guys know what that means? Has anybody heard that term? What, what do I mean when I say sponsor? So that's, that's definitely one type of sponsorship. So it's similar to Women Tech Council. We have a lot of technology companies that support us. And we have sponsorship levels. And that gives them both PR visibility um, because they want it for recruiting purposes, for marketing purposes. It's really critical to them. So there's kind of a great quid pro quo. But the type of sponsorship I'm talking about is? Yes, 
but I want, to, I want to personalize that a little bit more. So he said, you know, they're brand ambassadors, they tell everybody how great you are, but let's personalize that. So as you go on your careers, whether it's, you know, whether you become an entrepreneur, whether you go into a company, you need to find sponsors, champions. So you need to find that person who's willing to use their political capital to help you get to the next level. And a sponsorship doesn't look like, hey, I'll scratch, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That's not what it looks like at all. Um, but you see this sometimes in, um, for example, you might be in a meeting, right? And uh, you have somebody who's at an executive level who will talk about the great job that somebody did. And so because that person is at a senior level, people say, oh, well, that's somebody we ought to listen to. They know what they're talking about. And that person said that this person did a great job. That's what sponsorship looks like. And so what are we going to think about that person that was just sponsored? We're going to think they did a great job. Maybe we should give them a more challenging project. Maybe we should have them own this thing that will give them more opportunities. So as you can find people that will sponsor you, and it doesn't, um, I mean, I, if I were you, I would read up on, it's, it's similar to mentorship, but there's a, kind of a different approach to it. So it's, it's not like I go to somebody and say, hey, will you sponsor me? It, it has nothing to do with that. But there's a way to get sponsors if you're very strategic about it, where those sponsors will open up career opportunities for you. And so if you don't know, you know exactly what I'm talking about sponsorship, do a little bit reading on it. And uh, I think it would really make the difference in your career. That's, that's what I feel like makes the difference in, in the people who get the, the leg up and those who don't. Okay, so be a lifelong learner. I'm a big fan of that. And help others be successful. Always be generous with your time, your resources. Like I said, when I meet somebody and I network with them, I think, who are two people I can introduce them to, right? Rarely do I get a, a thank you email like, gosh, thanks so much for introducing me to that person, but, but I know it comes around, like, right? I know that good karma creates karma. I'm a big believer in that. Finally, take care of you. So no matter where you end up, whether it's corporate, whether it's you know, startup land or being an entrepreneur, it's going to be tough no matter what road you take. And I, you know, I, think, I think we're all ambitious and we're, we all want to do great work. But make sure to take care of you, not at the expense of your own self and your own health or your family or you know what I mean. Make sure that you are finding places that um, will re-energize you, um, inspire you, and really make you want to go out and change the world. So if you want to connect with me, you're welcome to. I'm supposed to leave some questions, but I feel like, is class up? Is it 12.40? What time does class end? 12.50. Oh, 12.50. OK. So I have, yeah, I have time for questions if anybody wants to ask. Yes. So did you go to school at all for business, or was it mostly law and then technology? Law and technology. I, af after law school, I was like done with school. I didn't want to do any more school. Um, my husband got an MBA, and it's interesting. So he did a science degree and then got an MBA. So I will ask him sometimes, gosh, do you think I should go back and get an MBA? Um, and there's there's kind of two camps on that right there's some that are like you know mba is kind of something of the past and there's really not a, a, no need to do that anymore so i don't know i feel like if you're a lifelong learner if you're willing to do you know the internet research read books and things like that that you can get the the knowledge that you that you need i'm actually a bigger fan of hands-on learning of applied learning i feel like you learn more so through School Improvement at Work, um, let me go a little bit into deeper what I did there. So I, I ran business development, which in that company kind of meant that I ran the Skunk Works projects. Do you guys know what Skunk Works are? They're, they're kind of those side projects, the innovative projects that companies want to take on, but they don't want to dedicate their entire company resources to it yet, right? So I was kind of entrepreneurial within School Improvement Network. So I would take these projects and I would do, you know, kind of the business analysis on them, find the strategic partners, you know, figure out the core team within School Improvement Network to build, you know, whatever these side projects are, and then to validate them and say, hey, is this something that we want to start rolling out to the entire company? I feel like through that process, so I took on two or three uh, um, projects through that. I feel like I learned more about business than I would have in an MBA. So I think if you can position yourself in a way to get that experience, that that's actually probably better learning and um, it will actually stick with you better than, than some other learning. 
But, you know, if, you're, if your career path is, I want to go teach at a university someday, then absolutely get your MBA, get your PhD, get those things that you need so that you can make the difference that you want. So it depends on your career pathway, what you want. So I'm not going to say it's a good or bad thing. It just kind of depends. How's that for a, a lawyer answer? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I would have jumped out of law sooner. Um, it took me a while to figure out that I really loved more the business, the strategic side, and um, so I would have I would have jumped out of law sooner. Um, I would have been less afraid. Um, I think fear holds us back quite a bit, actually, and. Um, and it's funny, you make a change and the world doesn't fall apart, and you're like, oh, okay, I can do this. So, so I think those are the two things I would have changed. Other than that, I'm really grateful for the experiences that I've had, though. Yes? So you were talking about computer science. Uh, so how do you relate that? Like, you're, good, you're good at like, that technology and stuff, but you don't like do the coding. You're just saying, like, get the idea, find the people that can do it. Yes. Yeah so, yeah. so I think, you know, if you're not going to be a coder, a computer science degree is really helpful for, and, and just know that I, I have a chemical engineering degree, so I don't have a computer science degree. But I think it's helpful because if you're going to do anything in technology, the better that you can speak to the technology teams, it's always better because there's so much productivity that's lost by people not being able to understand each other and talking different languages, right? Um, you'll find that you'll understand the strategy better. You can be more co cohesive on strategy. A lot of people actually end up managing technology people, actually. So if you think about the CIOs of the world, they're managing the technology people. And some of them come from English background, people that I've known, the CIOs, but they've built up the technology skills so that they can talk to the technology people. So if any of you have talked to developers, man, they speak a totally different language. Like, like some of them speak in SQL, and it's like, and I'm just joking, but they, they do speak a different language, right? So the better you can understand their language, you know, understand timelines, how long things, what's techno technologically possible, um, it actually will make you a better strategic thinker and better able to direct the vision and direction of, of whatever your endeavor is. Any other questions? 